welcome everybody to the um, spring 2022 in person, uh, yes, in person CNI uh, member meeting. It's, it's wonderful to be back with you. I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, um, and I have a few just sort of welcoming things to do, and then we'll get on with our opening panel. This kind of closes a cycle, because you may recall in 2020, we were scheduled to be here for spring 2020, and we canceled that meeting and moved it virtual on very short notice. That was one of the um, first meetings to cancel, not the first, but one of the first in our sort of circle of higher education uh, organizations. So um, it's, really, uh, it's really wonderful to be back in person. There's been an awful lot that's changed in the world, and um, this meeting is uh, no different than uh, many of the other things that have changed. We're now doing a lot of, we did a lot of things virtually. Now we are finding our way back to try and come up with the most effective mix of virtual and in-person activities. And uh, that has been, you know, a continuing work in progress uh, ever since the uh, pandemic. Uh, you've probably seen uh, various announcements about us moving our um, executive roundtables virtual permanently, about our um, pre-recorded project briefings that we're going to release every uh, two or three months throughout the year, uh, and um, various other things. And you will be hearing uh, more of these kinds of things as we go forward. I hope that when we gather in December, I'll be able to um, update you in more detail on those plans. But until then, please bear with us. We're all learning as we go along. Now, I'd like to extend a special welcome to a number of groups who are with us. Um, I think we have a very small number of international colleagues here, and um, my hat is off to them. <coughs> international in-person travel right now is still challenging. I believe we have with us a couple of the new ARL leadership fellows, uh, some CLEAR fellows, or former CLEAR fellows, some ARL Leadership and Career Development Program fellows, and in particular, some leading fellows. Leading is the LIS Education and Data Science Integrated Networking Group. And you will meet some of those folks when they give a series of lightning presentations on their work just before our reception. I'd also like to welcome um, a new member, uh, TIND, which is a spin-off uh, from uh, CERN that is doing some very interesting things. And uh, I'm delighted that they have joined us here today. I will just say in terms of safety protocols and things like that, um, Nobody knows quite where we are with this whole situation at this point. That's probably the most honest thing to say. There is no indoor mask mandate. There is a mask recommendation. Um, your guess is as good as mine. I would, I would say the following things. Um, people are in different places in terms of what they're comfortable with. Do what you're comfortable with. Recognize that other people may be in different places than you are, and um, give everybody a little room. I, there are more people here than you think, but these rooms are deliberately set to be spacious and somewhat cavernous, so there should be plenty of room for people to spread out. Um, but I don't really know 
what else to say beyond that. Uh, you will note that at our various um, uh, events with food, we will make provisions on all of them if you want to take, th take things to eat and take them somewhere else. Um, uh, rather than be, you know, seated tightly with a whole lot of people, that's a, that that will be doable. Um, and uh, with that, I just want to say I'm really glad you're here. I think this is going to be a wonderful meeting. We followed the same practices as we did in um, December of 2021 of really. Um, uh, Deparallelizing and um, loosening up the meeting to allow lots of time for networking and for people to get to greet um, and chat with colleagues they haven't caught up with. We're going to have a very nice reception tonight, and I urge you all to join us for that. With that, I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to introduce our panel and make a few framing remarks, and then mostly you're going to be hearing from our panel and not very much from me. So, over to the panel. Okay. Let me make some introductions going from the far end of the table Towards, back towards me. I am delighted to welcome um, Kent Wada uh, from uh, UCLA, where he is the Chief Privacy Officer. Next to um, Kent is Cheryl Washington from the University of California at Davis. She is the Chief Information Security Officer, or CISO there. You may remember Cheryl and Kent, um, they, are, they are very graciously reprising um, roles in a session that we did a year ago at a virtual only meeting. Uh, and I think um, you will find their insights really, really interesting. And I'm just thrilled that they're able to be with us in person to, um, so that you have an opportunity to chat with them informally as the day goes on. We're also joined by Lisa Hinchcliffe um, from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Lisa is uh, with the library there and I think is pretty well known to this audience for her writing on um, both privacy and broader issues around scholarly uh, communication and scholarly publishing, which certainly um, is going to figure into this discussion in some complicated ways. So here's what I'm hoping we can get at a little bit um, in this session. Privacy has been a sort of a central value of libraries for a very, very long time. And they have been fierce defenders of the rights of their patrons to read privacy privately, to engage with the literature privately. At the same time, over the last, I don't know, 15 years, maybe uh, maybe a little longer. There has been a rising emphasis on um, privacy and security issues in a, at a really structural level within our institutions. And one of the, um, you know, sort of key measures of that has been the increasingly common um, uh, creation of a explicit chief information security officer position and a little more recently chief privacy officer positions. Those positions have institution-wide remits and um, interact in very interesting ways with lots of different activities and policy making um, uh, throughout the institution. How do they connect up with 
the kinds of privacy issues that are emerging for libraries, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say festering for libraries as we move into an increasingly digital environment. And the sort of old ways of doing things don't work anymore, um, where all of a sudden privacy is tied up not just with what you do at your institution, but a whole mass of third party players. What can libraries learn from chief privacy and chief information security officers and their perspective? How can, how can the activities of libraries and the activities at an institutional level be most effectively coordinated? Um, how can they mutually support each other? Where are the friction points? So that's where I hope we can go a little bit during the next hour. And um, I've got a whole bunch of leading questions. Um, uh, they are short questions that will have long answers in many cases. And um, we will open it up for your questions uh, um, as the program proceeds as well. So I would invite you to be thinking about what kinds of questions you would pose uh, for this wonderful panel we've got here. And I think maybe to get us started, I'm gonna ask Cheryl and Kent to say just a few words about what a chief information security officer and a chief privacy officer are, what they do, where they report in their organizations, um, because I know that those roles may be a little less familiar to you than some of the other roles, such as uh, Lisa's. Uh, do you want to start us off, perhaps, Cheryl? Oh. <laughs> I was going to be gracious and defer to my colleague. Um, <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> um, that's a really great question. Let me set a little context. Uh, Kent and I have known each other for God knows how long, which means a very, very long time. And interesting enough, once upon a time he was in my world, and once upon a time I was in his world. <laughs> so to set it a little bit differently, or say it a little bit differently, um, early in my training and development as a security officer, I spent a number of years studying and becoming, um, I hope, an effective privacy officer. And once upon a time, I actually held the chief privacy officer title, along with the chief security officer. It was interesting that the organization I worked for decided to combine the two titles. Uh, it was truly a trailblazing move. I've never heard of any organization doing it before. Um, but to answer your question more directly, as the university's chief information security officer, my Responsibilities are defined in a lot of frameworks. I protect confidentiality, meaning that in terms of personal information, my job is to identify controls, tactics, techniques, practices, and even help craft policies to protect individuals' personal information. I also protect the availability of information. So as you can imagine, most of our organizations are large, diverse, complex. We have lots of information under our stewardship, and my job also is to make sure that data is available as needed or when needed. And the third um, component or dimension of my role is to protect the integrity of information. As you probably are hearing in the ether, most of our organizations are under a lot of attacks, cyber attacks in particular. So the other component of my job is to make sure that the organization, again, has the right tactics, techniques, controls, practices, and policy to protect the integrity of our information. Now, I don't do it alone. Um, most of our campuses in the University of California have privacy officers, chief privacy officers, privacy officials. They go by a number of different titles. There's no way as an information security officer I can do the work that I do by myself. And so I more often than not partner with the privacy officer, hence my earlier comments about my training. I have a high degree of respect for what privacy officers have to do. It's a delicate dance in many ways. And unlike, say, our frontier, the security space, there isn't a lot of directives or frameworks or 
practices that they can follow as, with the same degree of ease that I can follow as a security officer. Nevertheless, most of the privacy officers I've met, including my colleague here, Kent, are trailblazers in their own right and do some incredible things. But I'd like to end by saying that we are partners more than anything else. Kent? Thanks, Cheryl. And uh, indeed, we are partners um, in, in so many ways. Um, I think, uh, let me start actually uh, in terms of contrast. You said that your job as a security officer is to protect the confidentiality of personal information. So what you didn't say was you know, confidentiality, integrity, and, or availability and integrity. It's the other way around. CIA, right? CIA. CIA. Um, is that you are actually responsible for protecting the confidentiality of all information, right. not just about people. Whereas privacy, really, if you think about it, is about people. So I am concerned only about data about people. Um, there are lots of other kinds of data that are important and confidential. Um, for example, where we have uh, controlled substances on our, on our campuses. But that's not my purview, typically. It's really only data about people. So in some sense, you might think that privacy is a smaller space or a subspace Mm -hmm. of, of what the security officers deal with, but it's really, I think, more of a, dip, a Venn diagram uh, where we each have our own jobs. Um, privacy, on the one hand, does work hand in hand with security in terms of what I call data protection. So making sure that, well, in a sound bite, no more breaches, and no one likes to hear about another breach. And both the privacy side and the security side work together to do that. There is another part of privacy, though, that I think we are recognizing uh, in the larger world, in society, and that's really thinking about um, not so much unauthorized access to data, but around surveillance, Big Brother, the monitoring of behavior, the kinds of things that we are always you know, worried about uh, by some of the big tech companies, by government, by whomever it is, including uh, are uh, often our own community worried about our administration actually looking at their communications. And so I'm always also thinking about that kind of privacy. What does the, the surveillance mean? What does it mean when we're aggregating data, profiling people, you know, watching their behavior and learning from them for, for legitimate reasons? But, you know, again, there's a, there's a space where the law tells us um, what we can and can't do. Those are the easy cases because mm -hmm. That's just, you know, we can or can't do something. Mm -hmm. But in the middle is this gigantic area of ambiguity where it's entirely up to us, you know, at our discretion, whether we choose to do something or not. And that's um, particularly when we're, of course, when we're talking about information about people that I get involved. And it's really, in some ways, a values-based uh, issue. Some people like to talk about data ethics. That's become a very popular term these days about what the, what's the right thing to do. Should we do something? We know we can do it, you know, both technologically and by law, but in both cases, I would say those are the floors. They're not the ceilings. They tell us, again, you know, what we must do, not what, whether we should do something or not. Thanks. Those, those really put it in, um, in excellent perspective, I think, and it's very helpful. The, the focus on, on people rather mm -hmm. than the much broader information landscape. And I think that's probably something that resonates with the library perspective on it, which is also uh, strongly about people. Um, maybe we could start a little bit with what you identified as the, the sort of surveillance class of threats as opposed to um, uh, direct collection by the institution of information about what people are doing and whether they should do it and what uses it should be put to. Um, certainly, uh, there's pervasive interaction with various um, services and uh, content that potentially comes with a, a surveillance aspect. Um, how, do, how do we best deal with that? Um, uh, I, I invite all three of our panelists to, um, to reflect on that a little bit. Um, and uh, I know, um, Lisa, at least, you'll probably emphasize the, uh, the, 
library case. Um, so maybe we could start with you um, uh, um, uh, as, a, as a little bit of a frame for that. Sure, thanks Cliff. Um, so I think, you know, we're very familiar in the library setting with the fact that most of our information provision in a digital era is now provided not by the library directly. So at the beginning of my career in the print era, and even for a little while, we had locally loaded databases. So all the information provision and access, if you will, was sort of contained within the walls of the library. Occasionally let people leave with something, but mostly it was contained within the walls of the library. And so we had a fair bit of understanding of who's, of what data was collected about people's use of information or resources. We often struggled with not being able to collect enough to really know all those signs that we would put up saying, please don't reshelve the periodicals, <laughs> right? We're trying to figure out if anyone's using these things. And the best we had was, is it on the cart? Um, so even then, we felt a certain kind of lack of data in that print environment. So fast forward, essentially at this point, very little of information access is place-based. And certainly we saw during the pandemic that very little was place-based in many of our institutions. Um, and even our place-based information, the indexes, the OPEC, as we would say, is not place-based. So the searching for even those things that we hold physically happens on third-party platforms. So we are really, um, in most cases, quite unaware of the information architectures or where that data might be flowing. Um, we are certainly not the ones managing it or controlling it. And I think one of the things that we may have lost track of as this sort of happened over time um, you know, we, we held fast to that notion that the, the circulation record would be deleted when the person returned the book and sort of didn't notice that when there was no checking in and out, that didn't mean there was no tracking. And so at this point, I think we have to assume that anytime you're on a third party platform, you're being tracked and not just by that third party, but also by all the additional parties that it uses in order to provide the information that you want. Um, one thing I like to sort of say, too, is we actually want the back button to work on the browser, and so at its most fundamental level, we need a certain kind of tracking, and that's just quite different than um, the print era. So we have any number of concerns about where that data might be flowing. Um, questions, too, if we are correct, that information use can create a risk if other people know that you are using that information, then the user should also know where their information is flowing. Um, and one of the things that will be said, and this is an interesting contention, right? Like librarians will say, well, I'm concerned if somebody knows that they're being tracked, it changes their behavior. People who track are often like, yes, that is my point to change their behavior. So there's also this internal uh, little tension around what this might do. So where this data is going, um, but it includes library websites as well. Most of us using Google Analytics or some other product. So I am I really kind of take heart from a training I went to six, eight years ago now where somebody reminded librarians that our privacy policies need to be factual, not aspirational. Um, and too many times we have policy language that sort of aspire, that says our aspiration. Um, I can point to any number of library policies that will say things like, your library use is private, no one will know that you are using the library but you. That is not true. Um, and so we can have to think about if that's not true, then who knows? And this will, I'll turn this over to my colleagues here. The other question is, um, other people on campus also know. So historically, the library circulation record kept on a piece of paper, filed in those cards, was physically located in one place, and that was in the library. Um, and so this will be an interesting thing for us to discuss, too, of how librarians conceptualize the notion that they're part of a larger institution and that that larger institution might have some thoughts about what access it might like to library data.
Mm. Well, um, <laughs> we will forge ahead. With, and, a, with the soundtrack. Yep. Exactly. We're getting it going here. <laughs> I wonder if, um, if perhaps... Uh, <laughs> if, if perhaps, um, Kent, uh, you have a reaction to that or, or further thoughts on it? I, I'd like to think that uh, with this two years ago, I would be handling it better, but I'm still tickled pink I'm here at all. So <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is actually throwing me off a little bit. Um, yes, this actually brings to, get, uh, brings to mind several thoughts. Uh, you know, the whole third party thing is, is fascinating. I think for UCLA and many of our sister campuses and other higher education institutions have put together fairly mature programs for doing what we're calling third party risk management. And really, in this context, it's typically looking at uh, security reviews of our third parties to make sure that they're actually going to be able to protect our data the way we expect them to. Uh, for UCLA and other UC campuses, we also include privacy reviews and accessibility reviews as well as, as, well as security. Um, and if you think about it, the reason we do this isn't just to ensure to the best of our uh, ability that the third party is actually going to do what they say they can do to protect our data. It's also about how they're going to use our data. Um, you know, we have an expectation about how our data will be used. We don't sell data to third parties, for example, about our students. Uh, at least I hope we don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we have a whole bunch of things that we simply don't do, or that we do do. And that's not going to be true of our partners, necessarily, because if they're faced with a question, should I do this or not, they may come up with a different answer than we would. And it's because, fundamentally, the mission of their company or their organization is not the same as ours. And so, you know, we're answering a question like, should we, in the context of our mission? And if they're different, we may come to different answers. And that's why contractual language is so important, because that's where we actually try and agree, this is how we're going to handle things and align our expectations, so that to the extent possible, I can trust that the third party will do, will make the same decision I would make or UCLA would make in the same situation. Um, that said, you know, contractual language is one thing. What actually happens is much, much trickier. Um, for example, the use of our data to train algorithms. Um, you know, we are now suddenly part of an interesting experiment where we are helping a company to develop, a, you know, their algorithm to become better. In the end, it helps us because, of course, the service we're paying for becomes better as well. But at what point does that turn into, say, a new line of business where, uh, you know, suddenly taxpayer dollars, uh, students that, that, uh, who come to UCLA have been part of that algorithm training? You know, you can spin off all sorts of questions like that that are really fascinating. But I think almost the most interesting case um, is not the third parties. It's, as Lisa was saying, it's about us because we are now starting to really realize just what an asset we are sitting on. You know, it's, it's a gold mine of data, and we all want to use it for very important reasons, whether it's looking into you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, whether it's looking into how do we, you know, just administratively optimize and become more efficient, or how we do better academically. Uh, and all of these things fall under typically the title of institutional research, which implies a lot of analytics. You know, we're using some very sophisticated methods to actually analyze ourselves, and uh, none of it goes through an IRB. There are no controls, really. Again, this fits at the heart of the discretionary space, should we? And different people have different ideas about what's, what's reasonable. I want to also pick up on um, both um, Kent and Lisa's comments. One of the things that strikes me as you were talking is, is taking myself back to my own space. Mm -hmm. As Ken pointed out, we have a pretty robust um, third party or vendor risk assessment program. Um, but as you were talking, it, it dawned on me that the first evolution or first iteration of that program is, is sort of where, where, where you are right now. And it's not enough. Um, simply assessing uh, a third party doesn't really answer the questions that, that you've you know, articulated to, to all of us. Uh, question number one, you know, who owns the data and what happens to it? Uh, that's a really fundamental question, 
And a, a risk assessment doesn't really answer that question. What drives us towards an answer is being real clear in our contracts on what we mm -hmm. expect. But sometimes that too is not enough. And one of the things that strikes me is I've been working with our own campus on some mm, equally big challenges. Mm -hmm. And that is we went through the process of assessing the vendor, I think wrote a fabulous contract, and still had problems in terms mm -hmm. of who owned the data, where the data resided, et cetera. And it occurred to me that the missing element, and this is a hard one, is we have to monitor our vendors. Mm -hmm. We have to be not only clear, but also clear with intent that if you violate our contracts, violate our rules, we are going to do something about that. And this is where it gets hard, because I think in, in, in your space, there are not a lot of players on the table that we can <laughs> turn to, right? So it's, it feels as if your hands are tied. You know, five players on the table, four do not want to behave. What do you do? Mm -hmm. And I think that you know, as a body, we, we have to be real clear with all of our service providers that we may not take this for very long because we can't afford to. As Kim pointed out, we hold the keys to the kingdom. They want our data, yet they're making us feel like we're doing them a favor or they're doing us a favor. And that's not the case at all. And so as we go through, and, and my team actually participates in contract negotiations, we are trying to push that message forward that you're not here doing us a favor, you're a service provider. You know, your job is to do what we need you to do, and it's in the contract, and if you violate the contract, you'll be talking to our attorneys next. I mean, we're, we're trying to be a little bit more forceful about this, because I think it's time for us to pivot. Maybe it's long overdue to start making that pivot. But it, is, it's, it starts with, again, the assessment, contracting, and then monitoring, and then being prepared to take whatever steps are necessary as the next step. It's really interesting that you focus on the contracts there. Some folks know um, of my project that I'm currently in the midst of called Licensing Privacy, um, which is a look at how we can use our library contracts to um, leverage that relationship mm -hmm. um, for better data protections and the like. So um, released uh, yesterday are two white papers from that project. Um, one, um, reporting on interviews that Daniel Cooper, who's he here in the front row, <laughs> hi, <laughs> um, from Ithaca SNR did with a number of library leaders about where priority is in, or sorry, where privacy is in the priority stack during negotiations. Mm -hmm. And so how high will we push that up in the priority stack um, and against some of the other priorities we have, like access to journals? Um, and as you alluded to, we usually have one provider right. for those, those things, um, and we are often not doing an RFP or any other processes mm -hmm. that we have available. The other that was released to, uh, was the uh, rubric for at least doing an assessment of your existing contracts and uh, mm -hmm. privacy policies of those. So you can at least go through and say, like, we developed a concept of minimal viable privacy to say like, okay, this is like really low stakes, mm -hmm. but are you falling below that? Because then we've got some real concerns. Um, but at the last December meeting, the conversation that we did have at CNI as well was, okay, enforcement. Yes. And uh, especially when there's not a competitive marketplace, <laughs> there's not a, well, we won't get it from you, we'll get it from someone else. Um, how we um, leverage our contract when we have that kind of dependency is a real, a real issue. So I think it's, it's, you know, I appreciate you kind of bringing all these things forward, um, and, but ultimately it will also rely on people individually or in consortium being willing to put this kind of data management privacy ownership issues on the table and negotiate for them um, in the way that we negotiate for other things such as preservation, access for people with disabilities, all the other values that we as a library profession have that we insist on. So hopefully giving people some language to work with will help, but that's really like step one mm -hmm. <laughs> of what is a much longer journey if we're gonna use our contractual and just a little footnote, I will say, this is going to be even more difficult when we are paying for publishing services rather than reading access. 
Uh, so as we move to those pure publish and transformative agreements, I have not seen one yet that has a privacy clause when we're paying for publishing services. So let, let, let me ask a very specific question and also a somewhat more general question. I'm curious whether either Cheryl or Kent, you get involved at your institution in the library's negotiation of publisher, big publisher agreements and the language in those contracts? I haven't, but our librarian is in the room somewhere. <laughs> Mackenzie? <laughs> there you are. Uh, maybe she could speak to that at some point, but the way that the process unfolds at UC Davis is my team starts the, 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 the practice. We conduct the assessments. Mm -hmm. We're looking for these hot button issues. Where is the data? Who owns the data? what will be done with the data, and we try to illuminate as much as we can in a report. Next step is to sit down with like McKinsey and others to talk about what we have found and determine what we want to put in the contracts. UC has its standard terms and conditions. We have the option to amend or augment those T's and C's to meet the needs of our requester or our sponsor, which would be um, our library in this case. Mm -hmm. Then my legal fellow, uh, mm -hmm. I have one on my team, sits down with our contracting officer, our sponsoring officer, and they go through the negotiations. So to a degree, we are part and parcel of the process as long as the requester allows us to, to, to participate. The key here, and, and, and this is, I think, the, the tough part, is that there are not a lot of providers to go around, right? <laughs> so it's not as if we can say no to one because five or more are knocking on the door. Uh, and so I think that that's going to be the tough haul, and that's where organizations like this sort of continue to push the envelope and bring the, provider, I mean, the service providers to the table and try to force a change. But what we're trying to do, at least on my end, is to identify as many of these pain points as we possibly can to see what our librarians and others are willing to accept or not. I might just add a, a little wrinkle to this. I, over the last uh, year or so, we've come across um, working with our uh, bookstore who deal with textbooks. And of course, now the textbooks are typically electronic as opposed to being physical books. And they're no longer just electronic texts, but they come with electronic quizzes and extra exercise sets and all these other things where students interact directly. They have their own accounts. And suddenly it's like, well, wait a second, where's the agreement? We, you know, we didn't review an agreement you didn't need an agreement just for the textbook because that's typically about price, you know, pricing controls and that kind of stuff. And we have, in some cases, found there was no agreement to look at because they've never had to put one in place. And so suddenly we're faced with a situation where there is no agreement to even review, let alone to try and amend. This is something, I think, sort of the state of the art right now. We're going to have to, I think we're going to have to work with publishing companies on this. Um, some, some of them have, have, uh, have privacy policies, for example, but it's not directly negotiated because the negotiation is about price. It's not about anything else. Um, the, the other thing that I might add here is, uh, again, a little twist, is that, for example, the University of California has an initiative, a small business initiative in purchasing. And we have many such initiatives for really good reasons to try and tilt the balance in favor of of small businesses where we can. Uh, small businesses, though, I think as Cheryl probably has, has uh, encountered as well, are probably in the least, um, they're least able to meet our needs in terms of data protection and the many other things we require because, well, one way I could say this is that we have very high, you know, a high bar of expectations. The other is we are a pretty challenging partner to work with. <laughs> and, and, you know, small businesses often don't have a chief information security officer or a security officer that's dedicated or a privacy officer or any of these other things that we're looking for. And so, you know, we, on the one hand, we want to work with these companies. And on the other, it's like from a, from a risk point of view, it may actually be much more difficult. Um, so just, just, you know, sort of there are no answers to this. It's just we're faced with having to work through this every day now. Well, we have to get creative with each of these turns. I mean, with respect to, say, the smaller businesses, you're absolutely right. 
they often do not have um, a CISO or a chief information security officer or, or even a security plan or in some cases we have found we have to have a conversation about what is security and I don't mean that to be facetious or, or mm -hmm. you know, but I, I know how this feels by the way right <laughs> but oh, nevertheless <laughs> we do it I mean we want to encourage small businesses to develop and so part of my team does just that it's, it's a bit more bandwidth on our part mm -hmm. but it's worth the time and effort to bring some of these smaller businesses you know to a level where they can work successfully with the University of California um, there's no easy answer to any of this. I think it's probably the, <laughs> my concluding comment. We can just be done now. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I wonder if you could um, comment a little bit in dealing with the vendors on the mix between contractual language mm -hmm. and um, actual, I don't know what to call it, audit perhaps of what the vendor's doing to ensure that they are following contractual terms and uh, around, say, the amassing of data or purging of data, that mm -hmm. kind of thing? That, this is the, the, the complicated frontier, to be perfectly frank with you. you know, we've written, I don't know, any number of contracts and a handful we've gone back to you know, ask the question again of our vendors, are you doing X, Y, or Z? Mm -hmm. And find out they're not find out that they're not meeting our contractual needs. Um, this is out of my hands and into the hands of the requesting department and our legal counsel. What I said before um, is, is a description of an evolution of our program, and that is we can't rely on just one assessment mm -hmm. and the first contract to sort of say what the world looks like today. We have to, and we are reassessing some of our vendors particularly those that are dealing with high value assets, or what we would call high value assets, um, and trying to see, you know, are they indeed meeting our needs? Did they indeed do what was spelled out in the contract? And as I said, in some cases we're finding it's not the case. Uh, so it's a, it's a real, really challenging dimension and a growth of our program. It's a necessary growth. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is just finding the resources to keep up with the pace I think what we're hearing and what we all can agree to is that so much of what we do as an institution is being done for us outside of the institution. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of data sitting elsewhere um, with a lot of different service providers. I can't even begin to tell you how many service requests I receive per week of sending data outside or engaging with a third party. Uh, it's, it's, the numbers are staggering. Um, so it, it's a reality that we have to face, and again, I have to embrace this idea of expanding this risk assessment program to include that ongoing monitoring. Mm -hmm. And again, when we discover something, we say something. Do you want to add anything on that, Kent? I, I'm just thinking, um, I don't have, I, I, thankfully, actually, I don't have to get into that <laughs> aspect of, of sort of the compliance or the auditing. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, I think an important piece of this, if we rewind a little bit, um, thinking again about the, the contractual piece, one of the other differences, I think, between privacy and security, and, and Cheryl may argue, well, I don't know, you probably won't argue, but I think mm. you're, the privacy piece of you, part of you will, will agree with me, um, is that you know, from a security point of view, what you're really trying to do is protect the institution by protecting our assets. You know, People can't hack into them. People don't don't go and change data or steal data, whatever it is. But we're you know trying to protect the institution from a privacy viewpoint, which again means we're talking about data about people only. Um, it is also that again, no more breaches. You know, we don't want to let our data about people out there in the wild. But there's another aspect as well, and that's from the point of view of the people whose data it actually is about. So thinking about a, a typical contractual negotiation, you know, we say here are what we, UCLA, expect you as company X to do to protect our data about students, say, for example, that we're gonna hand over to you to provide the service to us, whatever that is. And you know, we haggle back and forth about exactly what that means. And then there's a piece of the contract that always says, okay, we've agreed on how you're gonna protect our data and then here's the language about, but in case something goes wrong anyway, mm -hmm. in a breach, 
you know, here's how we agree we're going to do things. You know, you're responsible for this, we're responsible for this, we have to coordinate, and we both have cyber insurance to pay for things so that when something goes wrong, you know, both sides have insurance. And we agree, we sign the contract, and we go, okay, we have uh, reduced the risk to something that's acceptable. But if you think about it from a student's perspective, you know, it's their data. If there's a breach and their data is out there now on the dark web, out in the wild, there is nothing they can do about it. Once it's out there, it's out there. There's no cure. You can't undo it. You can't get credit monitoring to help. You know, none of this stuff will help. And they will look at this, you know, risk equation and go, what do you mean it's okay? Just because you can pay, get pay, or you know, all of the money part between the university and the third party is okay doesn't make it okay for me whose data is now out there in the case of a breach. So, you know, there's a privacy piece which is really thinking about the risk to the individual as opposed to the risk to the institution. It's both. I mean, I'm paid by UCLA. I have to protect the institution as well. Um, but there's also, you know, sometimes I have to think about, I wouldn't go so far as to say being the voice of the people who aren't at the table because I can't possibly and you know, represent them all, but certainly raise the questions about if I were involved in this, how would I like to be treated in the case of a breach or in this, in this negotiation? Actually, I wouldn't disagree with you at all. Um, in fact, I strongly support your comments. Um, what I would probably keep in mind is, is what we're talking about is what happens when a decision is made. I want to use provider X or I want to send my data here. What I would suggest with respect to what you just described is, you know, take a few steps back and ask, do I want to do what it is described of, it, to put it, well, I'm trying to find the right words, but should I do this, whatever this is? Should I take this, this repository of student, student data and do this, regardless of the provider? And I think that is a more fundamental question that I hope that we can get into when we're dealing with departments and individuals who have this information at, under their stewardship and are making some decision on what to do with that information, whether it's sharing it with a provider or using it in some fashion. I think I'm also one of the people who probably gets well known and thus now I'm on a bunch of committees for having sent in these kinds of things. But as an employee, one also might think about their privacy, mm -hmm. not just, I mean, we definitely have a, a responsibility of care towards students in particular, I think. but. Um, you know, every year I'm mandated to take an incredible amount of online training um, <laughs> on Title IX, sexual harassment, mm -hmm. reporting, minors, it, it, there's a lot. And every time I'm the person who's actually reading through the, the privacy policy and, you know, gets to the point where it says, if you have a question, you can contact X person. So, and. What's interesting I'm hearing in the juxtaposition here is something I've encountered a number of times where they say, um, you know, don't worry, the campus attorney has reviewed this and, you know, it's fine. And I'm like, you are not my attorney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I noticed, for example, in the training on um, related to if somebody discloses that they have been sexually abused to certain people who work at the university, you have mandatory reporting requirements and you have liability if you don't follow those as a state employee. Well, the way the training is set up, it's an attempt to be interactive, so it asks you questions like, you know, please describe any time where you've, uh, you know, seen this kind of thing happen. And I'm like, okay, first of all, if I have seen it, I have reported it, but you're asking me to type something in that actually creates some actual civil liability for mm -hmm. me, and I don't have a whole lot of confidence, and if I can see that Google Analytics is running in the background, <laughs> that I really think that this is something I want to type in. So that's great for me, who just types three periods and moves on. Mm -hmm. But I really worry about people who have not spent an incredible number of hours of their life thinking about this right. kind of thing, and the degree to which we're exposing them to risk, just not by the system itself, but by what it prompts, and they don't have a thought process to say, is this something that's good for me to type in right. or disclose about maybe something that happened to themselves, which is certainly something we're seeing on websites like the Chegg and the way students are sharing papers they've written and papers in which they have discussed being abused or harassed mm -hmm. 
not realizing that then that's going into this algorithm, this search, all these sorts of things, in some cases then breached with their name on it. That, so I mean, it, like I wonder too about our educative role relative particularly to students and employees. Oh, I, I think it plays a dominant role. Um, one of the topics we're not talking about is the management of data. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe Kent, you would agree with me that in that same scope, we should also talk about you know, privacy by design, mm -hmm. security by design. I mean, what we sort of started off talking about were you know, the vendor relationships that we have to build and sustain. Again, I would suggest that we take several steps backwards and ask ourselves, how best should we manage data? Mm -hmm. How best should we design websites and systems so that we're not forcing people to disclose more information than is absolutely necessary? Um, that's a different discussion, but in my book, a much more important discussion than which service provider you select this week. I, yeah, no, I think that's, that's sort of kind of really basic. Um, I would probably add, we had a, an interesting discussion actually not very long ago within the uh, group of UC privacy officers um, around training about privacy and whether we're really focusing on, you know, because training tends to imply you're going to learn something, you know, some specific skill or ability or, you know, understanding of something versus uh, more general awareness of privacy. And I think we came to the agreement that we really need uh, just to, to raise the overall level of privacy literacy, mm -hmm. even if it's by a little bit, so people have an understanding of, of what they really need to think about. Even just what, when should I ask someone about something? And uh, this comes up in so many different guises, because again, there, as, as Cheryl and Lisa are talking about, there's, there's a huge, um, you know, just thinking before you enter and hit return, you know, what am I disclosing to people? Do I really want to disclose this? But then there's the other half. It's once it's disclosed, how can it be used? Even if it's legitimately used, it's not a breach kind of situation. Uh, and what, how can people take advantage of that, that data that you've now provided? Um, you know, there's a, most of, well, a lot of our laws about privacy, and we have a lot of them. You know, we, we tend to think in this country that we don't have a lot of privacy law, unlike the European Union, for example. Um, but we do. We have a ton of privacy laws, particularly in the states right now, in the, at the state level. But they tend to be very specific um, around certain kinds of data. And, uh, and so if you, if you um, aren't careful about how data is being used, then people will, mm -hmm. people will use it. Again, things like uh, using our data to train algorithms is now becoming a really big issue. What does that mean? You know, and, and how can you take that back once it's used to train an algorithm, say, to recognize your voice? How can you undo that? Is there any way to undo that? Can you actually, you know, can, can you get rid of the original data set now, a, after it's been trained? Um, there are just, just such a huge number of questions that are facing us today both about the unauthorized use, the disclosure piece, uh, which laws typically are pretty good at saying you can't you know, disclose it or it's you know, illegal if you do that. Um, but then there's a much more squishy piece around appropriate use and what, if you, have, if you have authority to access data, what can you actually do with it? Um, that's, that's a really interesting question. And I might add to that, what recourse do you have as the, the any level Owner, in here. Right. Yeah. I mean, we can have, here's what's acceptable, but if mm -hmm. something is done that's not acceptable, um, the data is out there, but we also might have a notion that then you're owed something for that harm, but how do we assess that harm? Mm -hmm. Whose liability is it? Is it the institution, the third party? Where does that, that fall in there? So I think it gets more, you said before it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, and you know, fundamentally it, it's, uh, you know, so many of our laws, if you think about the, our security breach notification laws, where if we suffer a breach of particular personal information, we have to let you know. And the theory being, well, first of all, you should know, but secondly, you can take action to protect yourself. You know, if there's, uh, if you're at risk because of a social security number breach, 
you can get uh, identity theft protection. You can put a fr uh, freeze on your credit uh, report, for example, or get credit monitoring. But increasingly, our laws, and in California, in fact, I think of January this year, um, they've added uh, genetic data, I believe, mm -hmm. so yeah. that if we breach genetic data, we have to notify the people involved whose genetic data was breached. There is nothing you can do about it. Right. You know, it's out there. Mm -hmm. And there's no credit monitoring for genetic data, as far as I know. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's out there. So why do we tell you? You know, what's the theory now? You can't perform identity theft. You can't protect yourself. So why do we tell you? Um, well, for transparency, for one thing. Because if we don't tell you and you find out, you will probably go, wait a second, you, you knew this and, and you didn't tell me? You know, what, what, what's up with that? You know, there's a trust issue, which I think is particularly prevalent or important for public institutions, but for everyone. And uh, I think we are heading in this direction where it's not just about uh, financial consequences or tangible consequences, but we're really talking about intangible privacy harms, you know, back to the value thing. I mean, I personally would like to know for if my transcript was, was breached, there's nothing I can do about it. I can't, you know, I, I don't know if anyone can harm me by looking at my transcript from God knows how many decades ago now, but I would certainly like to know about it, even if there's no law that says I have to be told. Well, you've already um, navigated to my next question, which really was about privacy education and support of the members of our community as people, not necessarily as employees, um, uh, but just as people um, and uh, what they need to know. Um, I want to open this up for questions from the audience, but maybe um, uh, while they're getting ready to do that, um, you could just make a final comment on um, this education perspective in terms of um, who, who's, who's the best group on campus to be doing it, or is there really no best group and it should be everywhere, or how, how do we actually get this education, particularly and most importantly to the students on our campuses? I can start, but I'm going to actually defer a lot of that question to Kit. As I um, think about um, information security and, and I dare say privacy protection as well, it seemed to me over the years that one of the missing elements was the human element. And if, if you think about the other triad that encompasses information security, people, process, and technology, I'll be honest, we haven't done nearly enough on the people front, um, uh, what, 30, 45 minute PowerPoint presentation on information security really doesn't cut it <laughs> in my book. And so as part of uh, the growth of the program that I manage for UC Davis, I've added a whole new component called outreach. And, and we're looking at it from multiple dimensions. Um, outreach to students. Uh, last year, a number of our students were the victims of scams. Uh, it was happening at a really fast clip and we were trying to get ahead of it and it seemed to us that we needed to talk to students about what was going on. Um, unfortunately, um, our voices are a little too old, so we put together a group of students to talk to students about these issues that impact students. Uh, we're seeing uh, at the federal level a number of directives impacting researchers, so another component of the program is to talk to researchers about cyber in particular, privacy eventually will come into the fold as well. Uh, so long story short, uh, we have not done enough in my industry to reach out to individuals, to educate them, to train them, to help them. And so as part of our program, we have, again, this brand new component that we're just starting, that we're just launching, where we're going to get out and we're going to spend more time talking to people. And again, it's going to be more than just the bread and butter once a year presentation. And why are we doing it this way? We need to learn about the pain points. As I said, I don't want to sit down and talk about what vendor or which vendor we're going to select. I need to understand how you're going to use this information. How are you going to use the data? How can we craft a website, going back to our scenario, where we're not asking for more than's necessary in order for you to accomplish your goal? So I want more of that kind of engagement. And so that's sort of what we're trying to do in terms of outreach and training. 
Uh, yeah, boy, I think uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. I would say, you know, for privacy, there is a need for sort of a, a general elevation of, of knowledge, but really I think that works best when it's contextualized mm -hmm. um, in the community of practice that, that you are in. Um, so I think about, for example, thinking about students and how they react when they learn about, you know, their data being, mm -hmm. how, how, how valuable their data is as, a, as an asset or as employees in, in this COVID era when our campuses have collected just enormous amounts of data for campus pandemic response and how that's being used, you know, data that was previously typically only collected in your healthcare context with between you and your primary care physician. Um, these, are, these, are, these are ways in which privacy is, are now ex or is now expressed. Again, AI is probably the other one where you know you think about privacy but what you're really saying is in this context this is why it's important and people tend to respond i think uh better because that's that's their area of expertise mm -hmm. um, if we learn about what they're doing as opposed to forcing them to learn about what we want them to know so for the past couple of years now i've been serving on our campus data privacy advisory committee which is a more of a governance and policy committee but through that, have also been partnering with our chief privacy officer at the University of Illinois, Phil Ryder, on building out, in particularly, an outreach and education program. So our primary events so far have been around Data Privacy Day each January, um, trying to bring in some students as trainers, actually, on laptop mm -hmm. checkup and that sort of thing. I think to say that there is an infinite amount of work to be done in this area is, is really uh, understating it. I think if I can just sort of turn to the library sort of audience for a second, one of the things that I think we're sort of grappling with is um, sort of our historic notion was we will protect your privacy. We will take that responsibility as the library. We'll delete your circulation. We'll do this. We'll do this. And so we were the ones taking the action. That is not, that is not an approach that works <laughs> in this distributed third party kinds of environment. And so we do have strong education programs in the libraries. This is where my information literacy background is serving me well, of saying, OK, if we don't do it for you, just like way back when we went and got the book for you out of the stacks, now we can't protect your privacy for you. So can we educate and help people make the choices that they want to make about the way their data will be disclosed to a third party or not. Um, but it's a real switch for us from taking the responsibility for t protecting privacy to helping people see the environment that they are in so that they can make their own decisions about it, which even comes back to then, I'm going to say, some library employee education. Um, with Kyle Jones at Indiana University, University of Indiana, <laughs> Indianapolis, um, uh, we've done some research on library, practicing librarian knowledge around user data, data ethics, and the like to inform a project called Prioritizing Privacy, which is helping librarians understand learning analytics and how library analytics might play into that. And what we found is that librarians themselves are not as fully educated around this data landscape and how data is flowing and the privacy concerns. And I think what I would interpret the results we saw is, as a result, they revert to that mindset of, we'll just shut it all down and make sure it doesn't happen. <laughs> but again, a real out of alignment with the realities of today's web-based, cloud-based, distributed, algorithmically driven environment. So I think as a profession, that's our internal challenge, which is this switch in mindset, but then also really understanding what's happening with the tools we ourselves are using on a daily basis when we're working with patrons. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to open this up now for uh, questions for the panel from folks here. There are mics uh, in both aisles, please. <laughs> so, hi, Todd Carpenter with NISO. Uh, a comment and a question. Uh, the first is related to a project uh, that we have been working on at NISO, uh, Seamless Access, 
We've just released a draft contract language for attribute release and the privacy of uh, protecting privacy and attribute release when you're using SAML for authentication purposes. Uh, that is open for public comment through the end of the month. So you have a four or five more days. Um, we'd really appreciate additional comments. There's only been a handful. The question I have for you is, how do we operationalize some of the things that you've been talking about? Like, a lot of these, dealing with some of these issues are very specific to the context, like attribute release for subscription services. Are there other areas that you could see model contract language or community best practice to help operationalize some of these uh, privacy goals? Thank you. I probably have a quick comment, and again, deferred to Kent. Um, one of the things that I'd love to see, to your, your point of operationalizing the things that we've discussed, is one, for the community to work as a community, first and foremost, but you know, two, to take some of these themes and turn them into tools. Um, case in point, Educause created the HECVAT, which is um, one of the primary tools that many of us use. Now, why did that come to be? Well, because many of us were moving our repositories into the cloud. The body, the community came together and said, is there a way to create a common instrument that many of us can at least leverage? The answer was yes. Uh, what we haven't done, um, you know, much to much chagrin listening to a lot of this conversation, is we haven't incorporated privacy as an element or a theme or a body of questions in that same instrument. Can it be done? Absolutely. It should be done. And so maybe one step we could take is, I believe Kent, you're still part of the you know, chief privacy officers group. Perhaps that group can combine its efforts with the security officers group and amend this tool so that we can incorporate some of these themes and make sure that we're all asking very similar questions. Why is that important? Because most of our vendors are getting the same instrument. At some point, they're gonna get the message, right? So that would be one idea that floated in my head as soon as you mentioned the attribute issue. Um, so it's great that you mentioned the HECVAT in particular, and Kent, I'm not sure if you were there when I met with the chief privacy officers I, last month. So um, Brian invited me to the chief privacy officers group of EDUCAUS to talk about the licensing privacy for this very particular reason of um, this question of the discussion that was already bubbling up around the privacy aspects missing sort of mm -hmm. from the HECVAT, and do we create a second one? Do we integrate it? I think. Um, and wanting to sort of hear about what the librarians were interested in seeing as well. So I was really excited to have that because I think vendors don't need a library form and a campus form and a, right, like it's, so the more we can partner across our professions, I guess, or however we would say that would be really powerful. And um, Brian encouraged me um, to please propose something for the um, Educause Privacy Conference in Baltimore in May. Um, I still had to compete for it, but I did get in. So <laughs> there will be a session um, at that Educause Security Privacy Conference in, in May around these licensing privacy issues. Um, as a member of the Seamless Access Group that developed the model language, please do comment if I can just plus one on Todd's uh, comment there as well. So I guess I'll, I'll just add, uh, there has been work Mm -hmm. actually under underway to add some privacy dimension to the HECVAT, but it's not quite as straightforward as, as we originally might have mm -hmm. thought. Um, nevertheless, Lisa, this morning over breakfast, I had a chance to glance through the two white papers, which were kind of, well, not kind of, they were very interesting. Um, and it did seem to me you had a long list of resources at the end, many of which were various frameworks. I mean, we're not lacking for a lot of work in this space. It's just gonna take some time to, to converge um, to become really operational. Uh, the one thing that I might add, I think that would be very helpful in anything that you do is to think about the transparency piece. So in describing to your community, whoever your community of users are, telling them what is going on with their data and just being upfront about it. Um, even if it's not what you want to be able to say, uh, you should be able to tell them what it is that they're, you know, what the data is doing and where it's going and who's taking advantage of it if indeed that's the case. Uh, because again, you're trying to establish trust and, and you can't do that unless you're disclosing what it is 
you're doing as the steward of their data. Jen, I think you were next. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm so excited that we're having this conversation, and the reason that I'm excited about it is because it feels like it was a conversation that was happening in the academic technology space uh, several years ago um, when we were starting to license software as a service tools um, and our learning management systems, and we're really asking the question, you know, who owns the data? What are we going to do with these student analytics? We know that they can help students and, and others sort of understand student learning behavior, but yet there's a, a real concern there. And I'm just sort of hearing um, echoes of those conversations from what it feels like so many years ago. Um, and I just want to sort of look to the question of where are the natural alliances in the library world, and, and I would like raise the hand and say in the academic technology space, um, to shine a light on vendor practices and continue to sort of raise this as a concern. Um, I, I would say that, um, especially in Cheryl's space, um, in, in the um, security realm, all of our resources people are going to uh, breaches that are notifying, that are triggering, that require us to notice. And there's very little space and time and energy for much else in, in, in the resource world. And so it can't just be to the campus privacy officer <laughs> and the chief information security officer. It has to be a coalition. Um, and so my question to you is, where else do you see the natural collaborators? I'm saying academic technology. We're licensing a lot of um, tools right now. Um, I, I happen to be a CIO uh, in the collaborative world space where people are putting a whole bunch of information on whiteboards and, and you know, collaborative tools. And I keep thinking to myself, oh god, where is this going? And is it identifiable? And how long are they keeping it? So where else are the natural collaborators? And how do we keep this in the forefront of our conversation? I'm going to start, and I'm going to ask Mackenzie. <laughs> I'm sorry, but years and years and years and years ago, a long time ago, before I became what I was told as a seasoned security professional, I was really focused on data. And I had said early on that we may be going off track by spending so much time talking about how to secure something and not nearly enough time talking about the data itself. Um, there used to be lots of conversations re regarding data management, and you guys may remember this. Discussions and, and people coming together to talk about the data itself. And so I, I, I would wonder if there's a moment for Ken McKenzie to talk about the data management program that she has spearheaded at Davis, because I think that is a representative of the answer to your question, the alliances. Who should be brought to the table to talk about the data itself? Sure, thank you so much, Cheryl, for volunteering <laughs> me to do that. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm so impressed. Yeah, no, uh, and Cheryl, you've been such a wonderful partner in this. Uh, and what she's talking about is something we call the Institutional Data Council at UC Davis, which is a forum where um, the library, the CISO, other people from our IT office, the chief privacy officer, other people from academic technology, you know, we all get together on a council that, that discusses these issues with Senate faculty and student representation. So it's a group, it's actually kind of a big committee, and I co-chair it with a Senate faculty member, but it, it has provided a place for these conversations to happen, and you know, it, it can get ugly sometimes, but you really do, um, you get to hear everybody's perspective, you get to discuss the trade-offs between transparency and, and all of California's wonderful sunshine laws with the privacy expectations. So I wouldn't say that it has you know, revolutionized the campus, but it has provided us with a place to have those conversations, and, and I will give the library credit for really coming up with that idea that we needed a council, a standing committee charged by the provost to keep it going. So it wasn't a one-off. And actually got the idea from Berkeley. <laughs> it just didn't last very long. <laughs> we need to bring it back. Um, can I, I'll, I'll just add, uh, Jen, I, I don't know, you know in terms directly about the alliances, but thinking about uh, things like the learning, uh, educational learning, or 
educational technology space, as you say, they've been grappling with this for, for a long time now. And it feels to me a lot of the conversations that we're having right now, um, they are operationally very complicated to, you know, to, to do what we want to do. Like, to me, security is conceptually very easy to grasp, just like mm -hmm. secure it. Don't let the wrong people get into, into our systems. But it's exceptionally difficult to actually achieve that, if not impossible. Um, and in the same sort of vein, a lot of what we're talking about right now are operational challenges. You know, the fact that, that we don't have enough resources, that our contractual negotiations are not perfect. There are all these things that make it complicated. But it's conceptually pretty um, simple, I think. There are spaces that are really much, uh, that are much more, we, we just don't know what we don't know yet. Uh, the research enterprise is one of those spaces, I think. It's not clear just what, you know, how you apply privacy to the research enterprise other than through uh, the institutional review boards who deal with human subjects research. And I think we're increasingly understanding that that's necessary but not necessarily sufficient. Um, the, other, the other thing I, I guess I might say, oh, the, one thing I might say is that our, our colleagues in the health sciences, um, when they think about data release for, for medical records, for patient records, are probably uh, quite a bit more mature than we are on the campus side, in part because they have a, you know, a much uh, sharper focus, a much more laser-like focus on what they do, what their mission is, what the data types are. Um, but nevertheless, I think there are some good lessons to be learned. Um, but the, the one comment I really do want to make, and that is you know, privacy officers, often like security officers, like auditors, attorneys, risk management people, we're always sort of the no people, or tend to be seen as the no people. Cheryl might be the exception. Uh, uh, no, not might. She is the exception uh, that proves the rule. But we tend to be seen as the no people, or if not the no people, the slow people. You know, we take our time to figure out what to tell you. We can't just say yes or no immediately because we have to do the analysis, and that takes time. Um, but there's a, you know, and legitimately that's so. Uh, we have to worry about the risk to the institution. But there is something to be said for thinking about um, are we optimizing for risk or are we optimizing for opportunity? And the two are not the same thing. You know, we tend to, on, on our side of the world, tend to see things through the lens of risk and reducing it and saying, well, is the benefit sufficient that we will take this risk? But in fact, that's not the same question as saying, is the risk too high, or too, well, too high for us to be able to do, which is really this thing that's really important to us as a university, this research, this, this program, whatever it is. I mean, it's sort of like, if you only ask the one question, it's sort of like having a lawyer argue this, you know, this one case on both sides and having a single lawyer do that. That doesn't work well. You can't give the best argument on both sides. And I, I just would like to make sure people are always asking you know, the question about opportunity as well, because it's always a balance. It's, you know, privacy is not absolute, and neither is anything else. We are always trying to balance, uh, well, we're not balancing laws, those we have to obey, but, you know, put aside the, the stuff we have to do. Um, we always have a bunch of obligations, whether they're administrative or legal or policy-based or contractual-based, uh, contract-based, and a bunch of values like privacy um, that we have to weigh in any given situation. Hi, uh, oh, Cliff. Go. This will have to be the last question, I'm afraid. Thank you. Uh, I'm Eleni Castro from Boston University Libraries, and I was thinking another place of synergy or connection could be with data scientists mm -hmm. or computer science. For example, at Harvard, they're working on differential privacy. So how can we do machine learning and AI that combats the privacy issues that algorithms are creating now? So that's just another place that we can start working together with other folks. Thank you. The I, I love that comment so much. Um, we just launched an ML project that's embedded in the security program. Um, it, it's collecting a vast amount of information and, and um, using some really sophisticated algorithms to tell some kind of compelling story. But there is a missing element. And you're absolutely right. We're not looking at it at this stage through the lens of privacy. We're going to have to. Uh, I'm not touching AI just yet, 
<laughs> because I think we need to do that first, that is look at privacy and then AI. But ML is such an attractive feature for us because I just don't have enough people to do what the machines can do. But you're absolutely right. I'm going to have to add a, a privacy layer on top of what we're doing. Thank you for your that, comment. That, that would be privacy by design. Mm -hmm. Privacy by design. <laughs> You know, one of the most interesting um, uh, efforts I've seen on that differential privacy kind of by design is the most recent census, uh, which used that very explicitly for the first time. Um, and that's a really interesting story you might look up. We are, unfortunately, at time. Uh, I only had about 15 more questions I wanted to ask <laughs> these folks, and I suspect you have a few, too. Um, I hope that they'll all be around for um, at least some of the rest of the conference, and you'll have an opportunity to chat with them. But right now, would you please join me in thanking this wonderful panel? <laughs>